Hello, everybody. This is uh, Pat Jarrett from the Virginia Folk Life Program. And uh, thanks for joining us for another installment of Uncovered from the Vault of the Virginia Folk Life Program. Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that uh, Virginia Humanities is on the original land of the Monacan Nation, uh, the people of the land and waters around our home in Charlottesville, Virginia. If you'd like to know more about uh, indigenous peoples in Virginia, we suggest visiting Encyclopedia Virginia or uh, ask around. It's, it's, uh, we'd like to make that acknowledgement first. Uh, this series uh, is where we, uh, hopefully you already know, we show old digitized uh, videos uh, from our archive and we premiere them here uh, so that we can kind of relive some of these old memories while we're all locked down and not seeing shows. And today we have a, quite a special show. Um, we've got um, a performance from around 2004. We're still trying to nail down the exact year, but we have Aaron and Matthew Allwell performing with a longtime collaborator, Cleek Shrey, and uh, opening for them, uh, doing a song on the banjo is a longtime artistic director for the Prism Coffee House, Fred Boyce. Um, it's a beautifully shot show uh, by my predecessor, John Lohman. Um, and it's, uh, I, I can't wait to share it. A little bit of housekeeping. Um, feel free to comment on Facebook. We'll be monitoring those. If you're here on Zoom, you can uh, put your questions in the chat. We'll show the film, it's about 30 minutes, and then we'll be uh, having a discussion with the musicians. So uh, we're glad you're here. Um, and we hope you uh, enjoy this as much as we did. So without further ado, here we go. Sad. It's a sad piece of uh, American ballad music and uh, ballads, because ballads tell a story. And it, it also is a, it's kind of a different thing. It uses the banjo more as a rhythm instrument, I mean, a percussion instrument, which is basically a drum on the neck kind of thing. As I see you know, ballad players, I'm like, you know, what happened to the neck on the banjo? Steve Martin really kind of ruffled my feathers I mean, a long time ago um, when he said that it was impossible to play sad music on the banjo and have a voice. <laughs> Oh. 
hard whiskey has ruined my body. Pretty women gonna kill me.
uh, the second one is Brendan Hunters, and the last, the rope, the last two, that's great, the J. Monolon Chapel. Oh, oh, Ed Reedy. Ed Reedy, great old player for Chicago. Legendary. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
on the feet, everybody.
two groups together is not something that you hear very often in Irish music, but Aaron and I have discovered that it's sort of a lovely combination. And we're going to play a couple of uh, bamboo flutes for you, which is uh, a little bit of a different sound, probably from the sort of lower sound of the uh, modern Irish flute that you may be used to hearing. And uh, we're going to play three tunes for you. We're going to start off with uh, a waltz, a French waltz, actually, actually called uh, La Valse de Petit Genefille. And then we're going to uh, play a couple of tunes for you, two reels, um, an old time tune called Barlow Knife which we've sort of Irished up a bit with the help of our friend Dan, Dan Isaacson, and uh, then a tune called Spoil the Dance. <coughs>
All right. That's uh, that's where the tape ran out. <laughs> but I think it was a beautiful place to uh, to end. And we'll bring on uh, Aaron and Matt and Cleek. Are you there? I'm here. Hello. I, uh, yeah, I was waiting for my cue there, but uh, it we concluded the tune, so I didn't know what to do. Now I'm sitting here holding my film. <laughs> <laughs> well, sorry about that. I, I really thought it ended in the middle of a tune, and and I, it oh, was good. my mistake. So, so uh, what did y'all think of that? How that uh, did that elicit any strong memories from you with you guys? Oh yeah, tell me about it, Aaron. Yeah, well, you know, one of the things that uh, you know when when you first introduced this to me, I, I was especially excited about was uh, just you know it started making me think back about the prism and all of the times that I saw music growing up there, and uh, it's something that. Uh, our buddy Seth Single, Swingle, who I work with as well now, who also kind of grew up there, talk extensively about how uh, we just had no idea at the time how unique of a, a place it was, the quality of music that we saw on a regular basis. You know, you could just go there any given day of the weekend and, you know, you knew that whatever was happening there was going to be really great, so. Yeah, world class. I mean, I, I know I've seen bills from the prism that I couldn't believe, you know, just th they're coming through Charlottesville. Um, Matt, how old were you guys in that show? Do you remember about the age and, and what that's like playing there? Oh gosh, well, uh, if you know, if, if we are right that it was around 2004, and I think that's probably pretty close, uh, <laughs> that'd be how many years ago? And yeah, so <laughs> I mean, I was sorting through a box of uh, you know odds and ends recently and came across a ticket stub from a Prism show that I went to must have been in the late 90s with um, a band from Quebec called Mattapat, uh, who I was got to be friends with later on and, and early on sort of w would follow around as a as a fanboy. Um, and yeah, what Aaron said, I think is so true, like the prison was just this incredible place where you could go and see um, bands from Canada and Ireland and parts of Europe. And, you know, one night it would be an amazing bluegrass band. And the next night it would be an incredible uh, Galician band from Spain. Um, that was the first place I ever saw uh, a band called Cornog, who first toured the United States in the 80s. And I probably would have been a young child. I don't I don't remember the show, but it definitely, you know, made an imprint on me because uh, as an adult, you know, playing music and, and going back and kind of rediscovering some of that repertoire and some of those tunes from Brittany, um, just an amazing kind of confluence of all these different musical threads. And I think mad props to Fred Boyce for, you know, bringing in such world-class artists. And, you know, the, Charlottesville was a kind of a different place then, but the fact that we had access to this incredible music from all over the place was just amazing. Yeah, and, and, and it seems like, it seems like the kind of place that you, there was a big community that uh, kind of would, would, would congregate there and, and make music. You know, it seemed like there was a lot of social music and obviously you guys are brothers right but clique how did you get roped in to play with these guys what, what, what's that story well i i started playing the fiddle when i was like um in middle school and so there was a little like crew of people playing irish music around town at that time and it's sort of uh you know you can't avoid eventually hanging out and playing music so we were sort of a part of the the crop of people who were around and excited to make music that's cool and yeah fred, fred unfortunately couldn't make it today um, but i'm hoping to follow up with him um he really seemed to bring in and attract some of these uh traditional musicians and made it a good environment you know yeah, yeah well, and actually you know yeah sorry Oh, good. No, I was just, I was thinking, you know, back to how the, uh, the aspect of, uh, you know, interpersonal relations uh, that, you know, was very much on the strength of, you know, Fred being good friends with all of these people who came back. Very often people are used to playing larger venues and stuff and how it's one thing to just have a building and do the paperwork, but it's an entirely different thing to know how to work with people and you know figure out the things that they need to feel comfortable in an environment to play and create well and stuff like that so 
And so many new ones. This, oh yeah, go ahead. No, no, no. I was just going to say, and to create this environment that simultaneously felt like an amazing concert hall and someone's living room, where there was both this very high level of um, music going on, but also just a, a kind of a camaraderie and a relaxed, laid back, you know, small scale listening room, small scale, but sometimes, you know, there would be so many people packed in there that, you know, people are sitting on the floor and sitting on couches and uh, you know, standing in the back row and and just this energy uh, of the space and the, yeah, and the community. You know, that's something uh, and, and I hate to even bring up the fact that we've been on lockdown for more than a year. But, it, you know, that's what I that's what I love about going to shows is standing there with your friends, you know, shoulder to shoulder in a small sweaty club or uh, someone's living room or a concert hall or whatever that you know you feel that that electricity you know and it's it builds community um this is the the, the tunes you're playing were obviously social those are that's social music what does social music look like now <laughs> anybody I have, uh, I have so many words oh i'm just like trying to be polite but i have like this i can talk forever on this <laughs> well, we'll talk for but like no, I, forever <laughs> yeah you know i'll try to keep it brief but I, I think it's one of the things that i've been uh you know talking with a lot of my friends who play these like you said you know kinds of music that are social uh that one of the things that's been so difficult about the last year is that i mean it's 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 also hard for people who like uh people who play kinds of music that are more performative and that's not a, a judgment thing at all but that uh, the the thing about social music uh well you know what i would say defines it is that there's a common repertoire almost invariably there's there's material that you learn and the express purpose of that is to have common ground to share with people and it's really just the jumping off point for this you know kind of uh, uh communication that expresses things that you know i always just come back to it's uh, things that aren't verbal that you a lot of us you know things kind of bottle up inside if you don't have a way to let them out and words very often don't do it so one of the things that's been especially tricky i think for so many of us who this is this kind of music is uh part of our lives is that we're just used to having that mode of communication with people and you can talk on the phone and you can have conversational you know dialogue that's gratifying but they're just with the syncing thing with music it's this funny technical shortcoming that you know for all that we can do we haven't overcome and so we just we can't have a comparable experience without you know being in the same place as people and uh you know in some ways there are aspects of the performing of music that translate better to uh a thing like this what i keep wondering is that if anybody is trying to figure out a way that like lots of people can feed microphones back and clap at the end of a, you know, a piece and then the performer can hear that because that's one of the biggest complaints I hear is that it's like you're playing into a vacuum or something. Mm -hmm. anyway. And, and, you know, the interesting thing is, you know, if, if you don't want me riffing off that is that, you know, the, the prism was a venue, but it's still going on. They're still putting on shows, you know, current day in different places I, from what I from what I know about that and that's um, you know I believe at Seville Coffee they're putting on shows and it's it's just you know right now nobody's playing out so that, that those human intangibles you know are kind of getting I don't know muddled in there. Um, Matthew what, what, how are you coping with playing music these days are, are you are you get are you is there some sort of something that you're doing to to uh, replicate that or stave you over to the next show it's um i mean it's a tough time you know it's like the you can you can play alone and achieve a certain amount of um i don't know musical experience that way but there's definitely something uh missing when you can't congregate with other people i mean th this has been sort of a just personally a, a bit of a weird year for me because uh i moved back to virginia last spring um my wife and i bought a house that we're renovating I finished grad school and have been most, mostly doing construction. So it's been not the most, um, there's not a lot of music happening, even disregarding the, the, the pandemic, but uh, definitely looking forward to things starting to open back up and maybe um, hitting a point where, you know, people can start to 
gather together again. Yeah, it, it, it'd be, I, I can't wait until that happens. Um, now, something that I, that I noticed while I was watching this is that none of you guys had music in front of you. And I know that it's, there's a common repertoire. You know, there's, there, there are tunes you know. But it always, it always amazes me that you can recall a tune and just, you know, like look at each other and kind of know what each other is doing. Can, can any of you guys talk about that? Like knowing all these tunes and kind of being able to do it, just to, it, it, have it in your fingers. Like, what's that like? I mean, that like Aaron was saying, the shared repertoire really is kind of the thing that serves as the connection point with the, you know, with other musicians and the people that you play with. And to a certain extent, that's a barrier as you're learning the music or if you're, if you're kind of entering, um, you know, as a newcomer, that, uh, that knowledge or that shared repertoire is kind of your ticket in the door. Um, and, you know, there's, there's pros and cons to that. I think mostly pros. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, you know, different people have different abilities in terms of how easy for it is for them to sit down and play four or five tunes in a row without having to kind of work out those transitions. Um, you know, I know that if, if I'm working up a set for performance or in a kind of a concert setting, that is definitely part of the woodshedding practice time is not just learning the individual tunes, but kind of uh, stringing them together. And, you know, I'm not a neuroscientist, but I suspect that there's some synaptic connection that has to happen to not just uh, internalize and, and embody the music in terms of the individual pieces, but then kind of feeling the transitions from one tune to another as a whole uh, group. Is it kind of its own thing? Yeah. And and this was, this was an iteration, this concert we watched was an iteration of a band, I think I remember called Hell on the Nine Mile, is that correct? But there were a lot of people in that group. Am I am I right? <laughs> yeah. So uh, we released an album in 2005, shortly after the footage that we just watched was recorded. Um, myself and Aaron and Cleek Shry are on that album. Also, uh, Meg Madden and Josephine Stewart, um, and a cast of other characters, including Danny Nicely, who's no stranger to the prism. Um, so that I mean that that was a time period where Aaron and Cleek and I were gigging together often, uh, frequently joined by Meg and Josephine. And then there were other people that we would sort of bring in depending on where the gig was. But um, we, we performed under a bunch of different names, uh, sometimes a different name every gig, uh, which <laughs> we met earlier, we were joking about how that's a, that's a great way to build a fan base, right? If you, if you don't have a consistent band name, but Hell in the Nine Mile was kind of like the, the latest incarnation of that group yeah kind of makes it hard to put the band name on a shirt it's changing all the time <laughs> but i certainly like the name um so uh that had to have been you know that had to have been interesting i mean you guys are you you, you all well brothers mainly stuck to uh you know fiddle and flute and i saw a concertina in there um so you guys are mainly doing the the melody it, Cleek, what's the role of the piano in this music? Well, and I mean, I might just mention that I'm mostly a fiddle player, but um, I, when I was a teenager, I thought it was, would be fun to start playing piano with tunes. So, you know, I'm not really a pianist. Like I don't play like pieces on the piano. Um, I just play with fiddle music. Um, but yeah, the, the piano, uh, you know, as an accompaniment instrument of fiddle music is uh, older than the guitar. And um, it's just a good, it's a good instrument for dance music. Like it kind of gives a nice bounce and lift to mm -hmm. the music that um, I really prefer to most guitar playing, especially in Irish music. Um, and there's, uh, yeah, I don't know, I just, there's like certain piano players that I was really into at the time and um, can kind of like hear little, you know, bits of like what I was being inspired by when I'm listening. But uh, yeah, I, I went to, initially when I went to college for the first time I went to Chicago and um, 
there's like a lot of Irish music there and there's a piano in, in, a, in one of the pubs. So that was where I kind of um, got to like play a lot of piano. And then shortly after that is when that concert happened. And I was just like, I mean, I don't, I've actually never like had a piano any place that I've lived. So it's always been just like, if there's one around, it's something that I get to, you know, have fun with. Please, that's tragic. I, I want to help you solve, sort that out as soon as possible. <laughs> I'll be there in 12 hours. All right. Okay. <laughs> if anybody needs a piano, my brother, I will say, is pretty good at, at finding and transporting and tuning them. Uh, and he's got the bus to prove it. So, Cleek, he could probably help you out with that if you have a place to put it. <laughs> Thank you. Cleek, I, I have a memory of you re remarking uh, almost with, I thought, a note of disappointment uh, on how my piano on my bus was actually pretty in tune at a clifftop a couple of years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Did it go yeah. too far? <laughs> it, it didn't have that, that certain something. <laughs> I think in jazz it's called a blue note, but maybe it's just called being out of tune. I don't know. But yeah, uh, for those who don't know, uh, Arn, do you want to tell those guys about the, do you want to tell our audience about the piano bus? Oh, sure. Yeah, I, I can, I can synopsis it. And I, uh, well, I, you know, I just basically got to thinking, I, I don't know, 10 some years ago that, uh, putting a, a piano on a bus seemed like kind of an obvious solution to a, you know, a problem that like, I mean, it, pianos used to be everywhere in everybody's home and stuff and not necessarily in every campground at a festival. But uh, so I did it three years ago. It's called the piano bus. You know, when we're getting social again, you might see it at a festival near you and uh, it can fit, you know, kind of just the right number of people on it for a jam. And the acoustics are really amazing on a bus and buses are really cheap. And, uh, you know, more ecological than building some big, big mansion or something. So, you know, consider it, folks. <laughs> I'm already on board, man. And I'm, I'm not even a piano player. But just to just to show up with a with a bus. Neither am I, honestly. I, I just. I think it's I think it's a really great thing, especially to attract musicians to your camp. You know, if you got a, a something like a showpiece like that, I feel like it's really going to draw people out. Um, I love it. I love it. Um, well, you know, we, we, we've talked about this performance. We've kind of talked about social music. I, are there any special memories of um, the, the physical prism that you remember or, or of any prism shows that have happened that you guys really connected with? Um, and, and maybe what are you looking forward to next? Like just riff on, on some of that. I, um, you know, I mentioned Mattapat earlier, and I, ha I have definite memories of seeing that group there. And uh, I don't think that was the first place that I ever met uh, Benoit Bork, who was in the band at the time, a uh, wonderful uh, singer, bones player, uh, accordion, also very much known as a dancer. And so when I was in high school and starting to learn some step dancing, um, connecting with him at the PRISM as well as the Augusta Heritage Center, which was, I think, where I first would have crossed paths with him, uh, was a real treat. You know, these people who I looked up to and, and definitely was excited to meet and start to learn dancing from, and then to be able to have them, you know, come to my hometown was pretty special because the rest of the year, you know, apart from gigs at the PRISM, it was these sort of, um, one-off weekends or week-long events like Augusta or Swannanoa where people would gather, but then you would make friends with these people. And for me in high school, start to be mentored by them to a certain extent. But then these long periods of time where, you know, in the days before the internet, it's not necessarily easy to keep contact with someone who uh, you don't see often. But again, you know, that, that sort of meeting place or, or a, a place to be able to kind of reconnect with folks like that. Um, I think pretty, pretty exciting for sure. Yeah. yeah. Cleek, how about you? Is there a specific concert that you were involved with at the PRISM that, uh, or that you experienced that uh, stands out in your mind? Yeah. Um, I, the first live Irish music that I heard was uh, a PRISM show, which wasn't actually in the PRISM. It was uh, at the Jefferson Theater, but it was the, the band Alton. And that, that was like extremely exciting 
for me. And, um, but then other than that, I mean, like the prism was really uh, also, it does like in a way it all kind of blends together because for me, it was really kind of like what I did on the weekends, like setting up chairs and like putting out the cookies, like, you know, I kind of like volunteered there all the time. And like uh, also a big part of the prism for me, um, in that era was uh, its relationship with the Buichi Ju. So also at my first Prism show, I also one of the people working the door was a was a radio announcer and um, just asked me off the bat if I wanted to get involved with that. So that's that was a big part of my like high school, you know, extracurricular life as well. Certainly. And, and I love WTJU. They're a, a fantastic partner, but also they've got a couple of radio programs that I tune into. I don't miss a show. So I, that's shameless plug there. <laughs> um, Aaron, any memories of, that you want to share? Any concerts? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, I'm going to uh, sidestep to, or, you know, step back to talking about Fred and that the memory that stands out the strongest in my mind above all of the shows really is the first time that I jammed with him and another friend, Patty League. And like, uh, I, I think I wasn't really at this point as uh, involved in helping out with small details there as uh, Cleek because I, partly because I lived almost an hour away, but, uh, and I don't even remember what the concert was that I was hanging out after. Um, it was probably as soon as, you know, I had just recently gotten access to a car or something and could stay out, but, uh, yeah, I just remember staying up for half the night with Fred and Patty playing music and it being one of those experiences that was as close to anything of a religious experience as I would describe anything in my life. And uh, and we we played a bunch, the, the three of us from, I don't know, from then on for the next few years. Um, uh, some of the time under a name, uh, the name Pincham Slyly, which is also the name of a road um, on uh, off of Route 20, some of you all might have noticed passing by. Um, and uh, yeah, it was uh, just, uh, you know, Fred has a really uh, wonderfully broad appreciation of different kinds of traditional music. And that was one of the things that was always incredibly excited about, exciting about playing with him was that like, he was just as likely to, you know, teach me a Breton tune or, you know, an Ethiopian sorghum mashing tune or a Galician tune or, you know, so uh, yeah, I think uh, I, I would be really excited uh, if we can find some more archival tape uh, either with his, you know, uh, uh, like uh, John was saying, I bet he has ample stuff himself. And uh, that, that I think would be a great whole concert in itself. Just, uh, you know, some of, so, cause that, you know, that little clip there only sort of beginning, gave the slightest, uh, you know, bit of, didn't read really. Oh, truly, it, it was it was a uh, uh, tip of the iceberg, I'm sure. Uh, and and I I would definitely he and I are talking, and hopefully, in the coming months, we'll be able to bring him on and uh, maybe premiere some of his footage. Who knows? I, 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 I we've got a lot of tapes that don't have any labels here at uh, the Virginia Folklife Program. Uh, from one reason or another, either the ink fades or the I'll be glad to help you identify people, you know, it, it'll be a real chore having to watch all this footage, you know, but, uh, you know, I'm you know so, somebody's got to do it and I'll, I'll reach out for help from all of you, I'm sure. Um, now, uh, we're approaching the end of our time together. Is there anything that you guys haven't touched on that you'd like to get out in the air? Or if we're good. I can always wrap it up. I, I think it's, I, I love hearing you all play. You can really, there were moments in those tapes that I could feel the connection. Yeah, you know, I could just see like the one look and I knew that you were all synced up and that was, that's, that's magic in its own right. And I can't wait to get back to that kind of in-person activity. So I really appreciate you all being on. Um, is there any place people should follow you guys or anything you wanna promote? <laughs> uh you know look, look us up find us on on the interweb on the old interwebs uh the social medias and all that good stuff um i, I, don't, I don't know what uh, projects click or Aaron have coming up i'm sort of on hiatus myself but i'm sure that there will be things happening um 
can stop by uh, allwellflutes.com and check out the flute blog, which Arne and Dad and I have been working on recently, uh, putting up some posts for flute nerds and that kind of thing. So yeah, thanks for inviting us to do this. It's been a treat and, and a treat to see the footage too. I'd completely forgotten some of those sets of tunes as a set. So it was kind of fun to uh, get the little musical memory trip there. Yeah, certainly. You know, I, and yeah, I, can, I, I plug my flutes, but uh, you know, people are gonna have to wait, you know, seven or eight years. So I almost feel bad, you know, but if you want a flute, I'd be glad to make you one eventually. Best flutes in the world come from Nelson County, Virginia. That's uh, uh, all well flutes. Uh, their father, Patrick, uh, taught them both, I believe, right, Matthew? Are you been working on flutes too? Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> well, so if you want some good flutes, check out all well flutes. Oh, we got Matthew. Sorry. He was Sorry, I didn't realize I was muted. I was saying that uh, Aaron's really the one who has stayed and mastered the trade he he's been working in the shop all along and i'm very much an apprentice myself but um now that i'm back in virginia i'm excited to be uh kind of re-engaging with the the flute shop so that's good it's a great spot cleek should uh people follow you anywhere you got any projects you want to promote i do have a uh i'm actually doing a concert <laughs> um on may 5th which just got finalized and um there's going actually going to be like a small in-person audience but it's online um uh presented by this venue in brooklyn called Let. and i can uh, drop the link or something but yeah, we, yeah that's cool. we if you send me the link i will promote it on our on the virginia folk life program social channels great great thanks cool Excellent. Always love to hear about new music coming up. Um, and if you're around tonight, speaking of Augusta Heritage Center, uh, Virginia's Elizabeth LaPrell, the my favorite ballad singer. I shouldn't play favorites, but she's an amazing singer. Uh, she's going to be doing a virtual event, uh, I believe, through the Augusta Heritage Center. That's where I saw it uh, tonight at 7 o'clock. Uh, I saw it on Facebook, but we'll share it on the Virginia Folklife Program uh, channel so you can find it there. And uh, I think next month, uh, there's possibility, a likelihood that we'll have Emily Spencer on. Uh, I'm not sure exactly which recording we're going to be sharing, but uh, hopefully we'll have uh, a couple other White Top Mountain Band members on there. And uh, again, we're the last Tuesday of every month we're doing Uncovered during the lunch hour from noon to one. And uh, we really appreciate you coming out. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for being here. Really appreciate the music and we miss seeing it live. So thanks so much for having us. My pleasure. All right. Have a great day, everybody. See you later. <laughs>